Good morning. On behalf of the family of Gavino, Nicholas, we want to welcome you to the Pawpaw Adventist Church for a celebration of his life. I know that you have many memories, many great smiles. I've known Lalo for, oh, going on six or seven years. Uh, had the chance to serve as an associate pastor at the Kalamazoo Church and work with the Filipino Company. And you all are gracious and, and wonderful and godly Christian people, but definitely do, you, you definitely get that from somewhere, and it was reflecting very strongly through Lalo, and he was just a great godly man, and so I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here for you and your family as you celebrate, as you mourn, as you go through this service. Just a few announcements that I would like to encourage you uh, to... Uh, keep in mind, one is during the service, please remember to silence your cell phones. I know that some of you will probably want to take pictures or videos and things like that, but please remember to at least keep them quiet during the service so we can focus on, on uh, what's really important. Uh, we will be live streaming. We are currently live streaming, actually. You can look us up on YouTube if you wanted to share the link. Uh, we'll also have video archives available later uh, if you wanted to have that and you just wanted to sit and, and kind of reflect on the service. Also, uh, after service, there will be a luncheon. Our luncheon will be held in our fellowship hall. Our church's fellowship hall is go back out the main Go down the stairs right by the front entrance, and our fellowship hall is right in there. Uh, the family did a beautiful job of getting it together, and we hope that you can stay for a meal and to just gather and, and uh, reminisce, share memories, and just pray that uh, God be with us during that time. There's one other announcement I wanted to note is that there will be a slight order of, ch order of service change. Uh, a couple of our special musics, our musical selections, will flip-flop, and so... Um, this is a, a very nice uh, overview of what sorts of things will happen. It, they might be in a slightly different order, so just kind of play along with us as we go. At this time, I'd invite you to bow your heads as we pray. Good morning, Heavenly Father. We thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to gather and to celebrate. Here we are celebrating the life of one of your children, Loved you dearly, and it showed. He was beloved, and it shows. So we gather here to reflect, to go through the process of saying not goodbye, but to see you later. To beloved father, grandfather, great-grandfather, friend. Father, I pray that you would be with us during the service. That as we mourn, you would stand by our side, and you'd give us hope for what is to come. That day when death will be no more, when sorrow will be no more, when tears will be no more, when you will wipe the tears from our eyes, because once and for all, sin will be done away with, the enemy will be gone, and we will be reunited forever and ever. But well, between now and then, be with us. Send your angels to minister. Help this service to be for your glory. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
tatai, lolo, and friend. Father, grandpa, and kaibigan. Gabino Nicolás has been a tatay for many of us, not just to his biological family, a lolo to the young generations and to the young at heart. And for sure, a friend to everyone who came to know him. When my wife and I first came to Michigan, Tate Nicolás and his family was one of the few families we considered our extended family away from home. This picture was taken when we were just four days in America. This was our first midweek prayer meeting at the basement of Kalamazoo SDA Church. I believe Tate was the head elder of the Filipino group that time. Back then, we saw our Kalamazoo church family almost every Sabbath or Saturday. After church, we spent time in potlucks and fellowship in someone's house. On one Sabbath after church, I remember having a potluck at Gobos at Tita Sol's house by the lake. We saw through the window lots of birds feeding on wooden bird feeders. Later, I found out that those wooden bird feeders were made by Tatay Nicolas. When I had a chance, I asked Tatay if he could make one for me. And for sure, he did say yes. In about less than a week, he visited us at the Benaag's home where we were staying at the time and gave me his new creation, a fresh wooden bird feeder of my own. I bought some bird seeds and later had the enjoyment of watching a bunch of colorful birds feeding in our backyard. A year later, we moved to our own apartment and it was January. Our son, Justin, would be celebrating his second birthday. Tatay and Nani Nicolas were housed in the Stadium Drive apartment. Tatay volunteered their apartment's multi-purpose hall to be used for Justin's birthday, and Tita Sol cooked and brought most of the food. It was a happy celebration in spite of the heavy snowfall. If I remember it right, Tatay gave us our first television set. He would visit every newcomer's house to bring food and some small appliances. He knew how it felt to be new in America, and that's how generous he was. Many of you might not be aware that I had a chance to help Tate build a bench around a tree at Dr. Santiago's backyard. I did the measuring and assisting, and he did the cutting of wood and hammering. It was fun. I think we started calling Lolo, we started calling Tate Nicolas Lolo once his grandkids began having kids of their own. Lolo seldom spoke at church but he had a one-liner that I will never forget. He would always include it in his sermons. Ang mabuting ginawa mo sa kapwa mo ay babalik din sa'yo. The good deeds that you have done to other people will come back to you. Lolo believed in the Bible's golden rule. Do unto others what you want them to do to you. And I think that is a very good lesson we can learn from our Lolo. Now that our tatay, lolo, and friend is not here with us, we still have that hope that someday, if we are faithful like him, we will see him again, not on this earth, but in heaven. And this is my prayer. Good afternoon. To those of you who don't know me, my name is Tony Soledad. I am a former president of the Philippine American Association of Southwest Michigan. I first met Mr. Nicholas sometime in the mid-90s 
during a Christmas party at a mutual friend's house in Kalamazoo. He was conducting a rondalia, a string orchestra made up of Filipino-American youngsters playing various traditional Filipino string instruments who were there to play Christmas music for the entertainment of my friend's guests. The performing group were the sons and daughters of members of the Seventh-day Adventist Church of Kalamazoo that he himself had taught how to play all these instruments. If I remember right, one or two of the youngsters were his grandchildren. I didn't really get a chance to talk to him then. But I would learn in that brief encounter the three passions that drove Mr. Nicholas's life. The love of God and family, music, and mentoring young people. A few years later, my wife and I would relocate to Kalamazoo from St. Joseph, Michigan. It was then that I got to know Mr. Nicholas better. I found out that he was born in Montalban, Rizal, Philippines, a town not too far from the big city of Manila where I grew up on October 25, 1921. He was of my parents' generation, a few years younger than my father and a couple of years older than my mother. He and his wife, Eleuteria, came to the United States in 1984 to join their daughter, Sally Laterman, a nurse who was working at Borges, Borges Hospital. He had six grandchildren and would later become the proud great-grandfather to 14 great-grandchildren. At this point, I will start to refer to Mr. Nicholas as Tatay, the most common term for father in most of the dialects of the Philippines. I use it as a term of respect and endearment for someone who was, very, who was a very dear friend and who I looked up to as my own father. He was so well respected and loved in the local Filipino community that we all invariably referred to him as Tatay, looking up to him as we would treat the patriarch of our clan. I would learn that his great love for his immediate family easily overflowed towards those around him. He was very welcoming to the new families that, came in, that he came in contact with who were relocating to Kalamazoo from all over the world, especially Filipinos and Filipino-Americans. My favorite vignette from the years that I knew Tatay was his playing Cupid to a young Filipino nurse who quickly married the young fellow that he had matched her with. And it turned out to be a very successful marriage. Tatay loved music. He taught himself to play several musical instruments, the piano, guitar, accordion, harmonica, cello, and other traditional Philippine stringed instruments that are used in the rondalia. He would later teach youngsters who showed an interest, including all his grandchildren and great-grandchildren, how to play these traditional Philippine stringed instruments. As I had mentioned earlier, he was the one who organized the rondalia that I had listened to several years earlier. He also loved to sing and would accompany others who shared his love of singing on the piano or the guitar. 
I felt so honored during the celebration of his 95th birthday a couple of months ago when he requested me to sing to him a traditional Filipino patriotic song. Little did I realize then that it would be his way of bidding me farewell. That was the last time I saw Tata alive. The summer of 2002 was the first time I got involved with the big league softball world series, which was then being hosted annually by the city of Kalamazoo. I soon, I soon found out how heavily involved the Laterman family was with the games, and more specifically, Tatay as well. The Laterman family had been hosting softball players from the Philippines and from countries that represented Europe for several years prior to that. Tatay essentially took care of these girls, cooking for them, bringing food to the Philippine tent that had become a fixture of these games, cheering for them at all their games, and teaching the Filipina girls the meaning of perseverance, working towards a goal, and above all, pride in one's own native land. For 10 years, from 2002 until 2012, I witnessed that I mentor all these girls that came under his care, and was greatly rewarded by a Philippine team that finally won the championship the last time it was played in Kalamazoo in 2012. And also the love and respect that these girls continue to show for him, even now that he's gone. It was during all these years of my involvement with softball that I grew to admire even more the generosity of spirit that Tatay demonstrated not only to the youth of his native land, but also to all of us whose lives he touched. Let me now bid you Godspeed, Tatay. You had lived a long and fruitful life. All of, us, all of us whose lives you have touched are grateful. But we also miss you. Go enjoy the rewards of a life well spent and glory in the joys of spending eternity with your maker. Rest in peace, dear Tatay. actually standing. <laughs> um, some of the things that you will hear here are probably some of repeats of some of the things that have already been said. But um, I'm Soli Leiterman. I'm Tatay's daughter, only daughter. Um, good morning. And I'm glad uh, that everyone is here. And um, thank you for coming. This is a day that most people would consider a very sad day, a day of sadness. But it should also be a day of peace and relief. Most of you who have attended Tatay's 95th birthday were rather surprised of his passing, passing away. His decline may not have been apparent at that time, um, but for the family members who have been around him weeks before and after the, that very joyful ce celebration, we knew that I was ready for that rest that God has promised for the weary. I remember a song we used to sing in church when I was 10 years old, and I asked Tata about it just a few months after he passed away. And I tried to hum it to him, and then he started humming it back. And and then pretty soon we tried to reconstruct the words. And I want to tell you that that song just embodies Tata's viewing, uh, view of death. The, the song was entitled, A Perfect Day. 
I tried to research it on the internet, but all I could come up are the modern versions of something that is entitled A, a Perfect Day. But um, we, I did try to reconstruct it, and it goes like this. A perfect day is coming by and by. A day of peace and freedom from all care. And that's all I can remember from the first stanza, but the, the, uh, uh, the chorus I was able to reconstruct without much difficulty. And it, said, it goes, when morning dawns, farewell to earthly sorrows, farewell to all the troubles of today. There'll be no pain, nor death in God's tomorrow. When morning dawns, the shadows flee away. In 2003, my mother passed away at the age of 79. I had the honor and privilege of doing her eulogy. It was a role that I did not want to relinquish to anyone. And I'm here today to do the same for my father, Tatai and Lolo, to most everyone here. I also want to mention that I'm speaking for my, for my two brothers, Renee and Verhel. I want to tell you that being the only girl has been somewhat special. You probably have heard the saying, give me a, you probably have heard the saying, fathers love their sons, but love and adore their daughters. I've always felt that love from Tatai and the adoration. You have witnessed over the years that we have been here. He has been a constant presence in my life. I will try to be brave. <laughs> I'll try to be brave, not to cry, which I already have. But if my voice starts and continue to quiver, please bear with me, I'll get through this. I can tell you his life story now, but how much time do you have? We can be here all day and still not capture even a fraction of his life's journey. We will have another party for that. Instead, I would like to ponder on some of Tata's shining qualities that made him so loved and respected, qualities that most of you would recognize about him, and you've already heard about it from our friend Tony and Toti. Number one, his love of people in general. He loved to be around people. He loved company at home. I could come home at home. Uh, I could come home, and I will have old boy there and and Mel, you know, and they're cooking in my kitchen. Uh, they're making empanadas and hopia and all that. Um, he was happiest when his family and friends came and visited. His outgoing personality was shown in so many ways. He was known to talk to people he met at Myers, Walmart, Marshalls, and the mall. He came home with addresses and phone numbers uh, of people I never would have met if not for him. He will tell me occasions and events that are about to happen, trying to tell me, you have to take me. I want to be there. At his age and with very limited English skills, he could carry on conversations with people of all ages and all nationalities. We were in a restaurant in Mexico one year with some friends, and we thought we lost him. Well, he was outside with some of the waiters who were on their breaks. Tate was trying to learn Spanish, and he was trying to teach them English. <laughs> Needless to say, they were having fun at that time. I didn't know why I remember that, but it did remind me of how gregarious he was. Over the years, he has developed and maintained long-term friendships far beyond what anyone would expect from a man who came to this country at the age of 64. Number two, love. Love of woodworking, and you've already heard this. He loves carpentry. He likes to fix things, whether it's broke or not. Okay. <laughs> He built me two arbors in two different homes. At the age of 86, I moved into this new home in Kalamazoo, and I made the mistake of saying to, uh, or thinking aloud, and I said, I wish I had that arbor in Gobos. I left town that week, came back on a Friday. There were four six-by-six six posts on the ground, 
and two weeks later, I had a completed backyard structure with roof, benches, and flooring all done by himself. Okay. Mind you, no materials deliveries were made from any local uh, stores. He bought the materials, took them home one carload at a time, including cement, patio blocks, roofing materials, and you name it. He carried them down the little hill we have in our backyard and worked till it's dark to finish what he thought I wanted. How many of you have his birdhouses? You don't dare mention that you want one because you were gonna go, you're gonna go home with one. <laughs> um, and there also, when we live in Goebbels, there was a barn there that we thought we were gonna hire someone to, to tear the bar down, barn down. Well, he did it with my mom. <laughs> he tied a, a, a rope, put it in the truck, and, and pulled the truck, I mean, uh, run the truck, and, and the whole barn came down. Not only he tore it down, and this is a, a qualities of my father, he not only, he's not a wrecking crew. He built things from those barn wood and he gave them away. He had benches, cabinets, you know, birdhouses, you name it. Third love, love of music, and you've heard it. I know most of you recognize this. Not only he loved to play musical instrument, he encouraged everyone else in the family to do so. That they has never had any music lesson ever in his life, he cannot read a single musical note, and yet he dared to play instruments that he could get his hands on. And I was mentioned earlier, the harmonica, the octavina, the banduria, the guitar, the bass. And of course, the latest one was the cello. And you know the story of the cello. He woke up one morning and he came to me and he said, I think I know, I think I can play the cello. Could you get me one? <laughs> and thinking of my childhood years when we were not, we, we, were, we were comfortable, but we were not rich. He bought me anything. He bought instruments that we wanted at that time. We were among the, you know, in the neighborhood that had the piano. And I could sing on that piano and play music. And he, because, you know, and I, as I said to you, he has never um, read a musical note. He would tell me if I hit the wrong note, okay? <laughs> Uh, the thing with the cello is that when he got it, of course, that was the first time he was playing the cello, it was not a pretty one the first two weeks. Okay? <laughs> the funny part is he never practiced when I was gone. He only practiced when I was home at night. <laughs> and the interesting thing, too, is that he had composed his own medley, which meant he can play America the Beautiful, How Great Thou Art, O Danny Boy, and End With Santa Claus is Coming to Town in One <laughs> City. But then he got better at it, and I have some videos of him playing the cello with great grandkids, Ian accompanying him. The grandkids had their rondalia because of him. He tried violin, uh, but that's too much for his neck and his arm, he said. So he had the great grandkids uh, learn and play them. Tate has so many varying favorite songs, and you'll hear some of them sang today. He loved hymns like what you heard, or what you will be hearing. I think is Holly here yet? Okay. Holly will be singing that song, and his, his secular song, his favorite is Odani Boy. He loved Kundiman, Filipino love songs. He also hummed and played his instrument a lot of the patriotic uh, songs, both American and Filipino. You see his love of music, and I can tell you that he played by ear, but mostly with his heart. It is a family legacy that will live on. Number four love is his love for his family, and you've already heard this, and I'm repeating it because I have written it. <laughs> there is no doubt that the strong bond that our family holds today originated from this godly man. He was the tie that bounded us together and will bind us for the remainder of our lives. Our family thrives on a lot of the humorous things that Tate had done. For those of you who knew him closely, he had a great sense of humor. He loved to make people laugh, he could turn a very awkward situation into a very interesting and delightful conversation piece. He has delighted us, us with his many funny stories about himself. He has this ability to make mistakes and laugh at himself, but not only he laughs at himself, but he tells story to other people so they can laugh about it at his expense. I can tell you one story right now, I just put in here that I wasn't going to, but I will. He went to Myers one time and um, in the Philippines, we call the restroom washroom. 
So he'd ask this girl, he said, can you tell me where the washroom is? And uh, the girl led him to the vegetable section, to the mushroom section. <laughs> And he said, that is right. And he bought the mushroom and he cooked something with it when he came home. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, and most importantly, I want to mention to you his love of Christ, his strong faith in God, and his devotion to the church. In 1955, he was baptized to the church and became a member of the first Filipino church in the, Philippi the seven first Filipino Seventh-day Adventist church in the Philippines. And surprise, he was a choir member. Final thoughts, we will miss him, but we have that great hope. I can say as everyone, every believer would say, Tatay, we will see you in the resurrection morning. Hello. Um, the song we're going to sing is titled Hindi Ako Nagi Isa. Um, it's in Tagalog, but my sister was able to uh, loosely translate it in English for those who don't speak Tagalog. So you can see it. It's um, titled I Will Never Walk Alone. <laughs> Bakit na babalisa, waring walang pagasa, kung tinik sa landas makita, mayroon kang kanlungan at laging kasama. Si Jesus tanglaw sa tuina, hindi ako nagisa sa king buhay. Si Jesus sa kapiling ko kahit sa a. Aking buhay sa iyo ay iaalay upang maglingkod sa iyo. Ang hirap at sakit, sakit tiniis mo dahil sa ko'y mahal. Sa, sa aking buhay Si Jesus sa kapiling ko kahit saan Ang angang kunyang ako'y hindi iwan Hindi ako nag-iisa Ang yaman sa buhay Kahit aking makamtan Kung buhay ko'y waglit naman Langit na tahanan Higit na 
kailangan kasama ng Diyos sa mang tunay. Hindi ako nag-iisa sa aking buhay. Si Jesus ang kapiling ko kahit saan. My name is Jaden Leiterman, and coming after me will be Ian and Nicholas. Um, we are Lolo's oldest great-grandchildren, and we will be reading some of his favorite verses. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life, John 3.16. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Isaiah, Isaiah 25, 9. And it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. I'll be singing Tata's favorite hymn, Keep Looking Up. Keep 
keep looking up thy God is still the same today keep looking up he will not fail thee come what may keep looking So do not doubt, but keep on looking up. Good afternoon, everyone. As you see in the bulletin, maybe some of you know directly, my name is Pastor Cameron DeVazier. I'm the pastor of the Kalamazoo Seventh-day Adventist Church, the host church family for the Filipino Company and the extended church family that they provide. And I want to thank you for the earliest part of this program. I wish I had known this when I first came here. It's good to catch up now. Um, I've only been here for just over a year. And I can tell you there's a warmth and a hospitality and a friendship and a family likeness within the church family and the Filipino church family in particular that is an example for all of us. And I'm so glad to know more about one of the great mentors and leaders in that movement today. And as Bible-believing Christians, we know for certainty the truth about life and death. The Bible, from its very opening pages, lays out in unmistakably plain language the true nature of human life. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, describing the Christ's creation of Adam, Scripture records, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Notice it says that man was formed from the dust of the ground, and it was the very breath of God that animated, brought into living that person. As the King James would said, and man became a living soul. We don't have a soul, according to the scripture. We are a soul. And the life that man was given was a gift from God. And it was conditional according to God's own terms. So long as man lived in obedience to God's law, that life was his for eternity. Tragically, of course, after Genesis chapter 2 comes Genesis chapter 3. The very next chapter records our first parent's downfall. And in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 through 19, God speaks to Adam of the wages of sin. Again, the scripture records, then to Adam he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife. Now pause right there. That is not to say we should not listen to our wives. Adam's mistake, however, is regarding his companion over his creator. Because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree of which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil you shall eat of it. All the days of your life. And the Lord concluded his counsel, his consequences to Adam, saying, In the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, with the simple explanation, For out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. You know, it's interesting, this same formula for life, that there is the the dust of the ground, the body, the physical, 
And then there's the animating life force from God himself that makes man, makes every woman, makes every one of us a living soul. It's repeated over and over again in Scripture. For example, addressing God's sovereignty over mankind, Job 34, verses 14 and 15 says, If he, that is, if God, should set his heart on it, if he should gather to himself his spirit and his breath, all flesh would perish together and man would return to dust. Very simple. King David speaks to God in poetry in Psalm 104, verse 29, saying, You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 7, describes death as the time when, quote, the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. This Genesis formula is repeated throughout Scripture. Humanity, simply put, has no inherent life, no natural immortality. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 13 through 16, explains without equivocation how God, quote, gives life to all things, for he alone has immortality. Thus it is that without God's life-sustaining breath, man simply does not exist. It's a state the Bible compares to sleep. And it's in this sleep of death that all emotion, sensation, understanding, and all other human experience and activity stops. We simply are not anymore. We're likely familiar with Solomon's stark assessment found in Ecclesiastes 9, verses 5 and 6. For the living know that they will die but the dead know nothing. And they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, and their envy have now perished. Nevermore will they have a share in anything done under the sun. And if that is all that we knew about life and death, is that we have life as a gift from God, we sinned, fell away from God, and therefore the wages of sin is death, and death is no more, that could be a very solemn occasion indeed. It would go from something solemn to something somber. In fact, the unavoidable reality of death, even for committed followers of Jesus, led some in the early church to despair. I praise the Lord that the Apostle Paul addressed this concern directly, encouraging the believers in Thessalonica you find this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. He, re, he, he speaks to them saying, I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. Now notice he's saying, even for Christians, when you die, there will be sorrow. But it is a, not a sorrow without hope. He said, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. He explains why. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which we do, even so, or in the same way, in like manner, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. It's almost as though Paul was saying, I want to make sure you know I'm not making this up. Jesus himself said this, For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord, which, by the way, friends, I have every intent on being alive and when the Lord returns. I believe it is coming soon and very soon. He said, For we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will no, by no means precede those who are asleep, for the Lord himself. Notice he does not send a proxy. He does not send an angel. He comes in person. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore comfort one another with these words. 
And what a comfort it is, not only to know the truth about life and death, but also the truth that in Jesus Christ we have that opportunity for life eternal restored once again. Of course, the best explanation of the hope that we have in Christ came directly from Christ himself. In John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus himself declares yes to the family of Lazarus, but also to the church family gathered here today, quote, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then he asks, do you believe this? And we affirm with steadfast faith, yes, we do believe this. But beyond merely securing for ourselves the hope of eternal life offered by Jesus, The true Christian lives to lead others to share in that same great hope. To the believers in Corinth, the Apostle Paul speaks to this very issue, that those who have the hope of eternal life in Christ now have a responsibility to instill that hope in others. After asserting that God, quote, has committed to us the word of reconciliation, Paul continues in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 22, To say, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Let me put it this way. God intends that Christians do more than secure their own salvation. He wants us to help others secure their hope of salvation as well. Put it another way, God desires us to be more than merely faithful to him. He wants us to be useful for him. And that's exactly as testimony after testimony has been shared today, and probably every person in this room has experience in their own life. That's exactly what Brother Gavino Nicholas did. He not only secured for himself a faith firm in Christ, but he dedicated himself to service so that others could share in the same. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, the Apostle Paul gives counsel about this. Verse 17 says, Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and in doctrine. Elder Nicholas in the church, and apparently here amongst the family, am I going to say this right? Tatai and Lolo? Amen. Strove to be a godly leader a conscientious role model for his immediate family and for his church family, for his example of loyalty and devoted labor for the truth, we praise God and honor our brother who now sleeps in Jesus. With his hand by faith in the hand of Jesus, Elder Gavino could doubtless say with Paul in 2 Timothy 4, verses 7 through 8, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Notice the emphasis, not just to me, but to others I can bring with me. Now, I feel it's important to emphasize this particular aspect of Brother Nicholas's ministry. I understood that it was an elder in the church and a leader, but it was oftentimes kind of behind the scenes, but he was always having people around. I've talked to some family members. They say people would just kind of show up. They're always around him. They'd always support him. They'd always help him out. He always had someone under the wing watching out for some younger one, helping them out, training them. And there is a ministry of mentorship that sometimes we lose in our society today. In our fast-paced, technologically-driven society, we lose something by always pining for the new and improved. In the Christian walk, there's a great deal to be gained from those who have gone before. In the experience and example of our elders, there is wisdom we would do well to heed. In fact, in the apostolic era, such mentorship was the norm. It was the expectation. It was the ideal. And it was one of the reasons for the church's initial success. 
And if you look through it in Scripture, you'll find something rather interesting. While, of course, the Apostle Paul wanted people to be followers of Jesus, he actually tells us how they became followers of Jesus, and it was by following his own example. Notice this. To the believers in Corinth, Paul said, quote, imitate me just as I imitate Christ. Isn't that fascinating? You can tell someone to watch Jesus, but how are they ever going to see Jesus? They're going to see it in you. Imitate me as, just as I also imitate Christ. That's in 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Similarly, he employed the Ephesus brethren to, quote, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Young people need older people in their lives. They need the wisdom. They need the stability. They need the encouragement. The Apostle Paul knew that. And our dear brother knew that as well. The ultimate aim of such mentorship, by, way, by the way, was that those who followed the apostles into faith in Christ might themselves become example to others. What is the best way you can honor this great man? It's to emulate his ministry of mentorship to someone else. Do not stop with the selfish, how can I attain, even in the Christian world, salvation for myself, but beyond merely gaining it for myself, how can I give it to someone else as well? Listen to these words from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 5-7. through 7. For our gospel did not come to you in word only. Too much of Christianity, the gospel is simply words only. Apostles said that's not how it should be. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. As you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers, now listen to the language, and you became followers of us and of the Lord. Now clearly the ultimate end is not to be apostles of, of Paul, right? But he says you are going to follow the Lord as you see me following him. There's a mentorship there. Again he says, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, with joy of the Holy Spirit, and notice, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and in Achaia who believe. Workers in God's day, last day remnant church have likewise been counseled. You'll find this in Christian service, page 59. Let the teachers lead the way in working among the people, and others uniting with them will learn from their example. One example is worth more than many precepts. It's one thing to say it and say it and say it. But what people need to do is see it in your very lives. The example in leadership demonstrated by Elder Nicholas continues to inspire the next generation of faithful church family members. And by God's grace, it will be this generation that sees the Lord return in our lifetime. And it is the return of the Lord, of course, that is the singular hope of every Christian, particularly those Seventh-day Adventists who look for that second coming. One day, I believe very, very soon, these hopes will meet reality, and Jesus will come again. Until that day, however, the promise is given in Revelation 14, verse 13. I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, write... Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Brother Nicholas now rests from his labors and his works will follow him. For the rest of us, the fight goes on. There's a lot of differences in this room today, but one thing we all have in common, every one of us is still alive. We have this day. If the Lord tarries and we too fall into the temporary sleep of death, what legacy will we leave? What example will we give to others? What works will follow our lives? I want to close with a challenge that we determine to remain not only faithful to Jesus, but useful for Jesus until he returns. 
want to close with the very closing words of all the Bible found in Revelation chapter 22, verses 20 and 21. He which testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. Amen. And even so, come Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.
before we have our closing prayer, let me remind everyone again that there is a fellowship dinner provided downstairs. Everyone is welcome to stay. Thank you so much for being here. And as we leave, let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your own Son, Jesus Christ, and the life that you give us at all, and the hope of eternal life that we have in him. And on this day in particular, we thank you also for the life of Brother Gavino Nicholas. Lord, thank you for his legacy of faithfulness, of kindness, of generosity. And Lord, now that his race is run, let us learn from his stride and continue following him as he followed the Lord. So Lord, give us health and safety as we leave this place. But more importantly, Lord, give us spiritual security in Jesus. Let us be faithful. Let us be determined to be useful until we see you come soon. For we pray that that day indeed will be soon, and that when it comes, not one will be missing. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.